Hey folks, quick note before we get started. We're doing a live taping of this show in New York City this coming Monday, April 22nd with the one and only Scott Galloway, NYU business professor, podcast provocateur, serial entrepreneur, and author of the new book, The Algebra of Wealth, A Simple Formula for Financial Security. If you want to optimize your life for wealth and success, and who doesn't want to do that, join us for a cocktail and what will surely be a lively conversation. Listeners of this show get 50% off the ticket price when they use the code PODCAST. Visit nextbigideaclub.com slash events to learn more. Hope to see you there. LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, Cal Newport's ultimate guide to productivity. I don't know about you, but I've spent a good portion of my life measuring my effectiveness in effort. If I run as hard as I can every day, I've thought to myself, if I work rapidly until I have no more to give, arriving at the evening like a shipwrecked sailor washed up on the shore, well, then I can feel good about my output. As a serial entrepreneur, it has often felt like a plate-spinning circus act riding a unicycle, firing off emails and texts while juggling projects, interrupted by various crises. It has been exhilarating. I've been for much of my career addicted to the energy, the novelty, the dopamine. The problem, of course, is that this approach to work is exhausting. And it's not very productive at the end of the day. When we're responding to endless communications, buffeted about by the shifting winds of other people's crises, it's awfully difficult to get focused, serious work done. In contrast, we all experience beautiful, serene moments, what some would call flow state, where time seems to slow down. It's in those moments where we do our best work. I think this is one of the effects of working at a natural pace that seems paradoxical to people. You slow down, you take your time with what you're doing, you, you, you're not frenetic. You feel like you have a lot more time. That's my guest today, Cal Newport. You may know him as the author of Deep Work and Digital Minimalism. We had him on the show in 2021 to talk about his last book, A World Without Email. Today, Cal is with us to discuss his latest, Slow Productivity, The Lost Art of Accomplishment Without Burnout. Cal has distilled his advice for how to work more effectively into three simple principles. Do fewer things, work at a natural pace, and obsess over quality. Isn't that nice? Do fewer things, work at a natural pace, and obsess over quality. And here's the cool part. These shifts in how we work reinforce one another. Doing some small number of valuable things very well and getting better at doing those things. The more absurd busyness is going to start to seem, the more anathema it's going to be to you to be on an email all day long, right? It's, going, it's, it's, the, it's the cure for this need for freneticism, it also gives you the leverage. So if you work somewhere else, as you get better at things, you get more control over your life. I have been trying this out for a few weeks now. If I do fewer things, will I get more done? If I work more slowly, will I work better? If I obsess over quality, will I lose my taste for freneticism? And holy shit, I think Cal is onto something. This is about more than efficiency. It's about more than getting stuff done. This is about meaning making, doing things we genuinely care about. And if we care about them, it's more likely others will care about them too. There's a lot in this conversation. We talk about the underappreciated literary tradition of American self-help, the work habits of early scientists like Galileo, Newton, and Marie Curie, as well as creatives like Jack Kerouac, Steve Martin, and Lin-Manuel Miranda. We talk about pseudo-productivity and multi-scale planning. Don't worry, we'll explain what that is. My hope is that you'll emerge from this conversation just as I did, equipped with new tools that will help you build a daily schedule 
that reflects your aspirations, not just for the week or the month or the quarter, but for the decades to come. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. Cal Newport, welcome back to The Next Big Idea. Ah, well, it's uh, my pleasure to be back again. Excited for it. Cal, you live an interesting life. You really have what most people would describe as two careers. You're probably best known as an author of advice books, starting with books like How to Be a High School Superstar, How to Become a Straight-A Student. I'm considering this for my son. Uh, In your student years, leading up to some really influential books you wrote, including Deep Work, which sold 1.5 million copies, Digital Minimalism, A World Without Email, and now Slow Productivity. You write for The New Yorker, you have a podcast, you have a newsletter. Most people would consider this to be a a full-time job. But this is not your only occupation or even maybe primary occupation. You're also an academic, a tenured computer science professor at Georgetown. Your academic research, according to your website, focuses on the theory of distributed systems with a particular interest in what can and cannot be solved in challenging settings. So my first question, Cal, is to what extent does your academic work and popular writing inform one another? Well, more recently, the answer is a lot, right? So, so at the beginning, oh, these were two separate things. So I started writing books early. You know, I, I signed my first book deal right after my junior year of college. So I was writing books before I was even a, a grad student. So as, as I entered academia, uh, I had already published four books because it was something I just did. Once I was in academia as a professor, the worlds began to come together. So if we look at my last four books, for example, At the core of all of them, the sort of motivating incident in each of those books is a way in which technology has intersected with the way we live or the way we work in unexpected ways and created new challenges and opportunities. And then the book is how do we grapple with that? So my academic portfolio has been, especially post-tenure, moving closer to this idea of I'm a technologist who now writes about technology and how it impacts the world. So yes, I'm a computer scientist at Georgetown, but I'm also one of the founding members of the Center for Digital Ethics at Georgetown and a director of the Computer Science Ethics and Society academic program. My writing for The New Yorker is about technology and the way it affects us. My books are about technology and the way they affect us. So these worlds have been coming together because it would have been unsustainable to be writing at the audience size I was and have it be completely unrelated to what I was doing and as an academic. You know, there's a long American tradition of self-help, which in some circles gets flack. I think of this American tradition as beginning with Ben Franklin, who's, who's somewhat of a hero of mine. And as you know, because you write about Ben Franklin, he was just this wildly productive human being, right? He was an influential businessman, scientist, revolutionary statesman, and, and this wildly successful author. And it seemed that he considered it maybe somewhat of a public service to share the methods of self-improvement that were working for him as he was living this incredibly productive life. Uh, he kept this list of desirable character traits, right? Recording his daily success and achieving them. I, I think he called that his, his project for moral perfection. You write about this. Yeah. And, and I, I admire Ben Franklin for, among other reasons, and, and listen to his counsel because I'd rather get productivity advice from people with a proven track record of being productive, opposed to people with a proven track record of making money off of selling advice, (laughs) right? So you fall into this category. And in this sense, your academic work kind of legitimizes you as a (laughs) non-charlatan. Is Franklin also a hero of yours? Yeah. I I mean, I, I, I love Franklin's work. I love his example as well. I mean, one of the other big things from Franklin's life I talk about in the new book is the big decision he made of his business was going really good. He had this printing business that was really going really well, but it was taking up a lot of his time. There was a lot of minutia in it. And he brought on uh, a partner and said, essentially, I built up this business and I'm going to pass this off to you and we'll split the profits, but you're going to run it and I'm going to take this out of my life. So he drastically reduced his income 
so that he could spend more time doing other things he thought was important. And, you know, he did basically invent all the initial laws of electricity. He figured out the lightning yeah, rod yeah, and then helped yeah, form the United yeah. States. So it was a pretty productive yeah. he got. But I, I, I love that example, which we often overlook, yeah. is we tend to apply this lens to industriousness to mean like, well, we have to be optimizing income or we have to be optimizing, you know, where we are on the leaderboard of net worth or something. But Franklin had this other idea of I succeeded in something what can I use this to, to inject to my life that might be interesting? Not how do I make my business, not just the biggest printing business in Philadelphia, but in the country, or how do I, how do I uh, triple yeah. my income? Uh, he was thinking about life much more holistically, but I'll just say briefly, I like your larger point. Self-help or advice used to be, and I think should still be the province of interesting thinkers, interesting people, people doing interesting things. And it, we're yeah. in this weird moment, I think, post uh, late 20th century, early 21st century, where we really look askance at advice. I get a lot of pushback. Do you? The code switching I do is confusing to a lot of people, uh, especially people in sort of more elite discourses. Like, well, wait, you're a New Yorker academic guy, but wait, you're your book has, you're telling people to do things, you know, and like pearls are clutched and the uh, monocles are falling out of eyes and stuff like this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it, it, there's this yeah. weird sense of like in academic circles, people are going to think you're presumptuous. And in journalism circles, people aren't going to think you're smart. And my whole approach is I don't have to use my writing to convince my peers I'm smart. I mean, I have a doctorate from MIT and written 70 math papers. So freed from that, I say, I'm going to put advice in my books because I, it is the conduit through which ideas most effectively actually affect change in people's lives is you give them these ideas. It doesn't have to be universal. It doesn't have to be perfect. People are very good at receiving advice, adapting it to their own circumstances, filtering what doesn't work. They don't need you to do that on their behalf. So I think more people should be giving advice, not less. Well, if we've ever needed advice, it's now. Uh, we, ha we have problems as a nation. We're experiencing a crisis of distraction, a lack of fulfillment at work. Do you want to walk us through how our relationship with productivity has changed in the last few hundred years and, and, and what led us to the state of, of what you call like a pseudo productive uh, state of distraction? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a critical story that we often overlook. We just think of productivity as this thing. We all know what it means. We, we use this term very confidently, but actually it really depends what type of work you're referring to for this term to make much sense. So if, if we think about productivity as a formal economic concept, we can date that back to Adam Smith. Uh, even before that, thinking about agriculture. All right. So in agriculture, we got this idea of we can measure output, in this case, let's say bushels of wheat per input, which in this case might be acres of land. We can say, how many bushels of wheat are we producing per acre of land? So now if we change like our crop rotation system, we could measure those numbers. And if those numbers got better, we could say, oh, okay, great. This is a more productive way to plant crops. That's where the, the notion of productivity originated. When industrial manufacturing came along, this worked as well, right? Okay. So we can measure Model Ts per paid labor hour. That's our input. Uh, and we have a very clear production process. Here's how we produce Model Ts. Now, if I change that production process and the Model Ts per paid labor hour go up, that ratio goes up, this new production process is better. So this uh, quantitative approach allowed us to sort of very efficiently search the space of possible production systems in different fields uh, and created this sort of economic productivity miracle where the amount of wealth being just generated, magnified by like a factor of 100 in a 150 years, just because we could use these numbers to figure out this is a better way to plant. This is better than that. All right. Now we get the knowledge work. This emerges as a major sector in the mid 20th century. Peter Drucker coins the term in 1959. None of this works anymore, right? Because in knowledge work, I'm not producing Model Ts. I'm doing seven different things. A week ago, I was doing six things that were completely different than that. The person next to me is doing 10 things that I'm not doing at all. There are no clearly defined production systems. All organizational strategies are personal and autonomous in knowledge work. We don't write down, here's how we manage our work. So all of the traditional economic notions of productivity failed to apply once we shifted over to knowledge work. And what I think happened then is in a sort of desperation, we implicitly fell back on a heuristic that I call pseudo productivity, which says, well, we'll just use visible activity yeah. as a proxy for useful effort. We'll all gather in a building, we'll work factory shifts. And I'm, you know, you're here in the office, I could see you're doing something. And, that, and that's just what we're going to do. So pseudo productivity, activity as a proxy for real productivity. 
that became implicitly the way we thought about productivity and knowledge work. And I think that is at the foundation of sort of many of the problems we're having with knowledge work today. And so we end up in this swirl of pseudo productivity. You say in the book, quote, many knowledge workers exist at that point of maximal sustainable overhead tax of all the all the different kind of projects and things they have in their mind that they're supposed to be doing and all the emails are supposed to respond to. Basically in a constant state of pain, but not quite enough to actually change their behavior. This is pretty grim. Well, and this is a expected consequence of the ambiguity and autonomy that just surrounds everything we do in knowledge work. So, so many of these issues that we talk about come from the fact that knowledge work is confusing and it's not clear what it, each individual is doing and it's not clear how they work. So we just leave a lot of stuff up to the individual. The negative consequence of this is that world of sort of freedom can allow all sorts of suboptimal configurations to take shape. So what you're talking about is an example of that. So because knowledge work is autonomous, we have no systemic way or systematic way of thinking about workload management. How much should you be doing? How do we keep track of what you're doing? Who's working on what? All of this is typically informal. It's just, you know what you're working on and it's captured in a bunch of emails that came in your direction or conversations in the hallway. So now we've left the individual knowledge worker to figure out on their own, manage your workload. And we're in an environment of pseudo productivity where more is better than less, activity is better than non activity. So our default is to say yes, because it's a very dangerous signal to say no if activity is what matters. So, how do we end up managing our workload? Like you just said, we say yes until the stress and pain of our workload gets large enough to balance out the cost of saying no. And then we were like, okay, I have psychological cover to say no because I'm so stressed out by my work now that, like, yeah. I will take the pain of saying no because I can't imagine doing anything more. So what does this mean? This means that we go around at exactly at the state of like the maximum sustainable workload before we crash. This, this can't possibly be the optimal workload right at the border of I'm about to just everything's going to fall apart. That's the standard knowledge worker, though. We use the pain of overload as our governor for pushing back on new work. And, and you see in, in, in recent years during the pandemic, perhaps, some triggers that cause that that more and more people have said, this is not working for me. I can't take this anymore. I mean, I mean do you see us as having hit an inflection point culturally or, or beginning to? Yeah, we did in the pandemic early on, in part because of what we just mentioned, right, is that like most knowledge workers were going along at the red line. What happened for knowledge workers when the pandemic hit? Well, there was this shift to remote, which did two things all at once. One, it just like generated 25% new tasks like overnight. Because, oh, my company just went remote. There's a bunch of stuff we have to figure out now to make that work. So it's just everyone had their task list grow suddenly by 25%. But we were already at this sort of red line limit. And then two, the efficiency of collaboration, the efficiency with which we actually execute things, it got worse. Because now we had to take all those conversations that we might have had for five minutes in the hallway and we put them into Zoom. But on Zoom, the, the, like the easiest minimal interval we can drag on our calendar is 30 minutes. So we had this sort of bloat on the time footprint of stuff we were already doing. So we're already at the red line. We throw in 25% more tasks and we expand by 50% the time required to actually service this work. And it pushed a mm. bunch of people over the edge. And what we got then was what I call the Zoom apocalypse, which was story after story of knowledge workers who would say, look, I have eight hours of Zoom meetings in a row. Like, I'm not doing any work. Like, literally every minute of my workday now is just talking about work. We had people saying, look, I don't have to commute anymore. Like, I, my life should be easier from a work perspective. And yet I'm staying up late and I'm having to get stuff done in the morning and I feel more frazzled than I ever was before. So I think the pandemic made it difficult for knowledge workers to avoid the reality that something is really broken where we are in knowledge work. And we reacted to this with a lot of sort of reform and revolutionary movements. There was these sort of primal reactions to this has gone too far. I think the knowledge work component of the Great Resignation, which was early in the pandemic, was caused mm -hmm, by people saying mm -hmm. this is intolerable. Quiet quitting. This was younger people mm -hmm. who couldn't do the Great Resignation. They were early in their careers. This was their response to it. Yeah. So I think a lot of these reform and revolution movements we saw during the pandemic from knowledge workers were really us having a primal reaction to the unavoidable unsustainability of what knowledge work had become. 
And and it's not just about about efficiency and and kind of getting all of our tasks completed. I mean, I, I get the sense, kind of reading between the lines of your books, and this really kind of comes out for me in slow productivity, that you see deep work and meaningful work as central to what makes us experience meaning and purpose as humans, right? That this is like, we need this, right? We, we need to be able to apply ourselves in a, uh, in a focused way to work that we believe in. And so there's kind of a crisis of meaning here, isn't there? I mean, uh, you, you said at one point that you think many people experience a void in their lives because of, I'm quoting you here, unmet potential, unmet interests, living in misalignment with things you care about. This is the classic catastrophe of life. And so is it fair to say that, that you see this as, as, as more than just about, about a productivity problem? It's a meaning problem. Yeah, I mean, this is why it's such an intolerable situation that we're in. Because we as human beings, and this is where I really differ from the anti-work movement and the anti-productivity movement right now. I don't see work in general as just this sort of construction of capitalist forces, uh, like a, a um, fundamental vector of exploitation to which we must resist. I actually think humans are driven to do things that are meaningful and pseudo productivity with its focus on activity doesn't let us do that. The standard pseudo productive knowledge worker today spends the majority of their time servicing the administrative overhead on their overstuffed task list. So like the majority of their time is talking about work, sending messages about work, coordinating work. Uh, this is like a designed as an almost psychological torture chamber. All I want to do is do stuff that I can be proud of and that's important. And all I'm able to do all day is sort of talk about the work. It's like I can see the, the food and I'm starving, but there's a little glass box around it. And all I can do is like walk around it. I mean, I really do think we need to produce important stuff that's important to us. And we've yeah. contrived a way of working that, that keeps us separated from that. How does social media and the way we use technology to communicate with our communities play into this? You have taken a famously extreme position in not being on social media at all. Yeah, I'm not at all a fan of sort of traditional social media. I mean, I am an old yeah. school computer science internet nerd. I think yeah. the model of social media is actually a perversion of the principles of what makes the internet so great, right? So, so with the yeah. internet, what do you have? You have this fully decentralized network. Now, anyone can talk to me. I can talk to anyone else. Right. You don't have to go through a gatekeeper to get permission to be to be on here. Everyone can communicate with everyone else. Social media companies come along and say, like, ah, that's no good. You're not going to find the right stuff. It's too hard to do things. We're going to build our own private version of the Internet in our own server farms, and we're going to control everything you see and watch everything you do. It's like a 1984 version of the original vision of the Internet. And I'm a big believer in we don't need algorithms. We don't need algorithms to solve the fundamental problem of the internet, which is how do I figure out who to talk to and what to read or what to see? I'm a huge booster of like what we're doing right now, like the independent construction of media. Like it, you and I are not, we're just, we're, we're producing a show. It's going to be a podcast. It's going to be on servers yeah. that anyone can download that follows the RSS feed. It's independent media at its yeah. best. But I do think what you do get, of course, with social media is a lot more intellectual conformity. You can have culture construction, right? If everyone is sort of seeing the same type of material and the same type of interface, you can really get this squashed narrowness. It gets rid of a lot of options and creativity. You know, I, I'll, I'll say that in my own life, I may be in a small subset of people for whom my social experience, I think, has been a net positive. I, I don't interact that much, maybe once every few weeks, and I share things that matter to me, either in the, from the world of ideas or personal experience, and it gives me a sense of having a kind of larger, greater circle of people who stay up to date with my life in some sense. I've also had some really amazing text message threads and email threads with friends that began during COVID, where we've had these... Um, very long conversations about things that are happening in the world that put pressure on our model of the world, uh, that conflict with our model of the world, that require us to ask questions and update and adjust our models of the world. So we had these like really fruitful, long conversations through both group text messages and when the when it gets too long and in depth email exchanges, yeah. which which I think are more reminiscent of the letter writing that we would have had hundreds of years ago, right? Yeah. This epistolary, collective midwifing of new ideas. Yeah. That's a, a, really a, a very lengthy part of our 
collective intellectual history. Yeah, and and, and so the internet makes that much easier. Like it, what you were yeah, doing there is a faster. fantastic example of the power of the internet that it allows this low friction, uh, universally addressable communication. But like that, think about that. That's like the meaningful thing you thought about from the last few years yeah. was these text and email based conversations with this group of people that you knew. Nowhere in there is an algorithm figuring out, oh, look at this. So how do we escape from the cult of pseudo productivity? What would it take for us to work in a way that not only generates results, but also creates meaning? Cal has a system, a three principle system, and he's going to walk us through it right after the break. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by HubSpot. More to-dos, less time, and so many tools to keep track of. Doing business can be hard, but you don't need a miracle to hit your goals. You just need HubSpot. Their all-in-one customer platform can make growing your business infinitely easier. Imagine this, higher quality leads, fast closing deals, wildly happy customers, and more benchmark breaking quarters. It's not a miracle, it's HubSpot. Visit HubSpot.com to get started today. Well, let's get into your three principles of slow productivity, which I love. They are number one, do fewer things. Number two, work at a natural pace. And number three, obsess over quality. Uh, and I have to say, all three of these of these principles, I find just therapeutic to say out loud, <laughs> right? Do fewer things. Yes, please. That sounds delightful. Work at a natural pace. Ah, a natural pace. Lovely. And obsess over quality. That also feels great. So wh why don't we start with do fewer things? You know most people's response to this is, how on earth can I do fewer things? I have all these other stakeholders and people in my life who expect me to do this long list of things. How, how is that possible? Yeah, well, so trying to do all those things at once is a catastrophe for the stakeholders in your life. It is a, a very inefficient way to actually try to get you to, to do things on their behalf. So, so let me explain a little bit more the dynamic here. What happens when you say yes to something? If it's a non-trivial thing, you have some work you actually have to do, but there's also a non-trivial amount of administrative overhead that follows that commitment, right? So there's emails that are going to be sent to talk about that work. Yeah. There's meetings to be had to update people on what's happening with their work. And this is all fine, right? This is how work happens. You, you have the thing you're doing and the overhead surrounding the, the administrative overhead surrounding the work. If you've said yes to too many things, each of these things is generating its own administrative overhead and that begins to stack into your same limited day. So eventually what happens is more and more of your day is being punctuated by the administrative overhead of this large number of things that you've agreed to do. So not only does it leave less time to actually do the things, the time that's left is not consolidated because administrative overhead doesn't just batch. It's not like, oh, the first two hours of the day we're talking about work and the next six I'm working on it, not spread out everywhere, right? Because you're, you're dealing with other people's schedules and emails like, hey, the message comes back, you got to bounce it back, you know, it bounces back to you. And so it's a cognitive disaster, right? So your ability to actually like make good quality progress on things is really diminished. So if we zoom out, and that's a big idea in slow productivity, zooming out and say, well, like, what's the rate at which, you know, Rufus is finishing these things? It's really slow because we have uh, so little of our cognitive capacity able to actually work on finishing the project themselves. So what happens if instead you say, I'm going to work actively on fewer things at once? Well, now when I'm working on the small number of things, there's a, a much less, uh, much less of my day is dedicated to administrative overhead. So I can really work on these things and I'm going to finish these things at a higher level of quality and faster than I would before. So if you say, what's the rate at which things are being finished, that rate goes up when the number of things you're actively working on at once 
goes down. So the key really to all of this then is how do we keep a sort of two category treatment of work, the stuff that we've identified that needs to be done, but we're not talking about it, we're not having meetings about yet, and the yeah. stuff I'm actively working on. And if you can make those two distinctions, work gets a lot easier and the rate at which good stuff gets done actually goes up. And you have a system, of course, for doing fewer things. It's a it's a pull-based system opposed to a push-based system. Could you share with us in some detail how, how the system works? Well, there, there's a conceptual core, and then there's a hundred different ways to implement it. So the, the conceptual core is you have a very small number of things that you're working on actively. And when you finish one of those things, you pull in a new thing to work on actively. So people can't push new things onto you that you have to work on actively, you pull them in when you're ready for them. So you have strict control over your workload, right? All right, so how do you actually implement this? This is where there's a hundred different ways to do it. Um, if there's a team, for example, where everyone's on the same page about let's do a poll system, and I, I profile some real knowledge work teams using poll systems in the book, you might have, for example, a centralized place where all of the pending work for the team is stored. You say, when we identify something that needs to be done, we do not by default pass it off to someone. We, we put it on a board, we put it on a wall, we put it on a Trello, whatever, so we don't forget it. But no one is responsible. It's not generating any administrative overhead. No one is actively working on that. Separately, we keep track of what each person is working on. It should be a very small list. And as you finish things, we can then look to this big pile of other stuff that needs to be done and say, what am I going to do next? And when you pull something in, now you have administrative overhead for that thing. If you're an individual... You could basically simulate this by saying, great, I, I have to say yes to all these things because whatever, my boss is telling me to do them and I can't say no. But I'm going to maintain a double list, waiting to work on, active to work on. When something new comes into my plate, I put it on the waiting to work on list. I make this public, by the way, so the person who asked me to do that can check in and see exactly the status of this thing. Okay, it's moving its way through the waiting queue. Here's the things I'm working on actively. I don't do emails. I don't do meetings about the waiting stuff. And as soon as one of those things hits the active list, when I pull it into the active list, uh, I email all the stakeholders. Okay, I'm working on this actively now. Call me whenever. Let's have a meeting about it. I'll answer all your emails on it properly. Let's do all the administrative overhead. I'm locked in. I'm going to get this done. I do it really well. So even if you're by yourself, you can simulate a poll-based system by bifurcating your own list of commitments. You're not saying no to people, but you're being more nuanced about your yes. Yes, I will do this. This is how I do things. This notion of, of, of doing less, we can talk about it in terms of projects that are active at a given time. There's also a question of how many missions do we have in our lives, right? And you talk about in the book your missions that you're focused on. And you say at one point, I'm nostalgic for two missions and I salivate over one. <laughs> right. So so what are what are your missions currently and 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 how many missions do you think we can handle? Yeah, I mean the, but the insight there is okay, especially when you have control, like you're thinking about the work you create for yourself. There the big idea is you do have to worry about these different scales, right? So like if at the very no. top scale, yeah, five big missions. I'm, you know, it's a it's a podcast, and it's it's this this business, but also this business, and I have this other podcast I'm doing, um, and I'm writing books. Uh, it's going to be very hard to keep the stuff you're doing on a day to day basis uh, from having too much overload because each of these missions is going to generate things that have to happen, um, and now the number of projects you have to grapple with is going to be large. So you can't just start at the the scale like this week. I just want to do fewer things. When you control your workload, you got to start at the top. And say, so, okay, the number of things I'm working on, if I make that smaller, there'll be less work being generated. It'd be much easier to have a more sustainable workload. And so it's something I work on a lot. You know, I have my academic work, but I've, I've increasingly, as we talked about, unified my academic work with my other writing yeah. because it was too many separate missions. I added a podcast during the pandemic, and that's another mission. And I've had to be very careful with that. And, you know, I have a rule that says for my own podcast, it gets a half day per week. And like, that's what it gets and it has to fit in there. And so if I want to do something new, I am going to have to automate something else or figure out how to do it faster, but it doesn't get any more yeah. time, but even still it's a new mission. So I have often a book I'm writing, often some sort of articles I'm writing and I have my podcast. So it's really like three missions. I'd rather have two. I think two is a better sweet spot. One would be great. Like a John Grisham or someone. It's like, all I do yeah. is write one yeah, book yeah, a yeah, year. Yeah. Like that's probably optimal for the human condition, but you know, three, I'm barely getting by, but I could easily have seven or eight. 
it, it's so easy. I mean, the number of things I have to say no to because I want to keep the number of missions small is a very long list. I've also heard you say that you've historically suffered from insomnia and that dealing with what I imagine is a somewhat kind of erratic cognitive capacity when you have a night of bad sleep might be part of what has caused you to want to build really effective systems. Well, also the insomnia gave me this real sort of psychological, not fear, but real sort of anxiety around having too many things on my calendar. Right. So it, it was this interesting sort of natural forcing function on this first principle of like do fewer things, take your time, but do them really well. That is exactly the recipe you would use if you really worried about on any given day, my ability to do stuff might be crippled. Right. And so for me, I get very anxious, even to this day, if I see a calendar that's full of things. Because I'm like, what if I don't sleep? That's going to be very hard yeah. to have a really packed day. On the other hand, if it's the, the far other extreme, all I'm doing is writing a book and I have six months to finish this book. It doesn't really matter if on a particular Tuesday you're tired, you don't do much writing. No one yeah. day matters that much. So that, that's that been, you know, I, I see it almost providential, this sort of, it's a sporadic insomnia. I, I Usually it's fine, but the threat of it has really right. changed. It really changed my relationship with busyness. Let's talk about working at a natural pace. Now, again, a delightful sequence of words. <laughs> it's what we all want to do. But I can hear our listeners asking, you know, how do I work at a natural pace with deadlines looming? Is this something that you think that applies to most people? C can an ER doctor work at a natural pace? Can an Amazon worker whose every movement is measured in time work at a natural pace mm -hmm. or a reporter with a daily column? You think it's a realistic goal for most people? Well, I mean, it's aimed at knowledge workers, right? So it's taking yeah. advantage of that sort of ambiguity and autonomy. So, so someone with shift work, so a, an ER doctor or someone working in a warehouse, those are different economic sectors, right? And, yeah. and, and so the, adv the advice there is different. But even within knowledge workers, there's some discernment to be done because there, there's really two different storylines in that principle that I think are both, they're both relevant and they both can be tagged with that same description, but they're kind of different in scope, right? So the one storyline in there much more applies to uh, self-generated work, right? It's like me grappling with, I have these three young boys and I can't be working all the time, but I'm also have these ambitions, like what am I going to do about it? And it's saying, take your time, measure your productivity over a decade, not over a week. Don't make it about what did I do today? Make it about over this last five years that I produced something that I'm really proud of. Uh, this allows you to have a lot more breathing room and variation. Uh, and in the end, you care about the stuff you do best. And so why try to squeeze it into the smallest amount of time frame? There's so many negative effects. So there's that level of it, which is yeah. you know not going to apply to everybody. But there's another level of it, which is just, okay, I'm just working in a knowledge work firm. I'm not, you know, writing books or what have you. And uh, where does that mean there? Well, what it means there is you need, we need to try to find variation in intensity. Like we don't want to have this mindset of every day you're supposed to turn on and be a hundred percent for that eight hours and just do this all year round. Like that's very unnatural in the sense of we're not wired for that as humans. So if we can work in variations in intensity, it's going to feel a lot more natural. And so a lot of the advice in the book, that's not about this sort of take longer on your productive dreams. A lot of the more tactical advice is trying to make this point. You have more control over the intensity of the work than you think. And you have to be, it's a game to play, but you can engineer a lot more sort of up and down variations. That's not going to be noticed, but can make your life much more sustainable as, as a knowledge worker. So there's a lot of that. So we have these two scales like stretching mm -hmm. out your ambitions as a sort of uh, autonomous knowledge creative. And then we have the yeah. inducing variation into the intensity of your work on the day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis so that you don't just have your brain break. Both of those ideas are sort of coexisting in that principle. I support the thesis that working more slowly can be more efficient, actually, or, 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 or kind of removing a, a kind of franticness from your approach to work, right? And I, I certainly feel more productive and definitely happier <laughs> when I'm not panicked and working at a natural pace. We we had Oliver Berkman on the show to talk about his book, 4,000 Weeks, which of course, one of my favorite books the last few years. And he has this wonderful metaphor, which he borrows from anthropologist Edward Hall, 
for how we experience the passage of time in our frenetic modern lives. He describes it as a conveyor belt with buckets on it. And we feel we have to fill each bucket to the top in order not to have wasted time, right? So it's this constant sort of panic. But, you know, then comments that, you know, time is not separate from us. You know, time is a medium we inhabit like fish and water. When I'm working at my most effective state, what some might call a flow state, time feels like it's moving more slowly. I look at my watch and I'm surprised that like only five minutes have passed and I've just, you know, gotten a whole lot done. So to, to me, there's something very powerful here about the kind of relationship we have with time and how we, uh, the, 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 the mindset and sensibility we bring to our work. Yeah. No, I mean, I think Oliver's right about that. I mean, Oliver actually has a very nice blurb on the back of Slow Productivity. Yeah. <laughs> I have a nice I blurb that. on yeah. 4,000 Weeks. We've known each other for a while. So we definitely have similar sensibilities. I, I think this is one of the effects of working at a natural pace that seems paradoxical to people. You yep. slow down, you take your time with what you're doing, you, you, you're you not uh, frenetic. You feel like you have a lot more time. Where on the other hand, you're like, I'm trying to do all these different things and I'm jumping around and jumping on calls as I'm going in between my things and on Slack with these other people. Those days go by uh, from a, a subjective experience perspective, like nothing. It just, those days just fly yeah. by. You're like, oh my yeah. God, like three months have just passed. It does not feel that way when you're just slowly grappling with something important and now I'm going to go for a long walk and come back. And actually we had drinks by the sunset this night because, you know, I'm just sort of stuck on this. I'll get back to it tomorrow. That's why I used the word natural pace. That feels more natural because I think it matches our wiring as humans better. That sort of do fewer things, have this like spend time on things, take longer on things. Your life seems a lot longer. Your time seems yeah, a lot richer. Yeah. Like it, it, it is, it's, it's because we're getting back. That's probably a more natural experience of time than this much more artificial experience that's very rushed that we get when we're frenetic. One of my favorite sections of slow productivity was your exploration of the lives of all these scientists and writers who generated some of our greatest scientific breakthroughs and created some of the greatest literary and artistic uh, accomplishments. Most of these people worked at a more leisurely pace than we think, right? What, what, are, what are some of your favorite examples of, of some of these? When you study these traditional knowledge workers, it is often surprising how long they took to do things, right? Yeah, I mean, you'll, yeah. you'll look at Galileo, they'll say like, you know, he was uh, in the, the, the cathedral in Pisa and was measuring the pendulum swing of the chandeliers and using his pulse as a, as a clock because he didn't have watches back then. He was figuring out the rules of, of conservation of motion in pendulums. Well, he did observe these things in the church. And it was years later before he kind of got around to sort of working through and actually writing out the mathematics. Newton had these insights about the inverse square law and calculus and gravity. It was decades until he really pulled this all together into a book. Uh, Mary Curie won two Nobel Prizes, but when she was Hot on the first Nobel Prize, she was about to isolate radium, which was going to be the source of her first Nobel Prize. She goes on like a three-month vacation with her family. I love this detail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you talked to her and said, that's so unproductive, you were so close to doing it. She would say, I won two Nobel Prizes. What do you want? Like, what did it mean? You know, I was going to, I'm working yeah. on this. I'm going to get it done. And she got it done. So it's interesting. Uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda was another great example. His first great yes. play, In the Heights, seven years. He's working on this thing. These traditional knowledge workers did not feel rushed to get things done. And we don't remember today how long they took. We just say, Curie's or Nobel Prizes, Galileo figured out about the planets, Newton figured out about calculus and gravity, Lynn Mamal Miranda wrote the two, two of like the great plays of the last 20 years. That's what we remember. Yeah. Not the fact that there was like, Murray was on vacation in France for months in the middle of this, or that Lin-Manuel Miranda had a freestyle rap group that he was like touring the world with when he was also working on In the Heights and he would take months off to go do that. We don't remember that today. We just say, oh, here's the stuff they did. And that was great. And he was also working as a substitute teacher, right? And had any number of other things going on. Yeah. I, I love I love the detail of, of uh, Jack Kerouac, who, who was rumored to have written On the Road in three weeks. Well, it turns out that's leaving out six years of rewriting and rewriting and rewriting, <laughs> right? That produced the novel that is on the road, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so, so we we do love the mythology of these of these acts of incredibly concentrated productivity, and and as you point out, though, there is a place for changes in tempo. 
Yeah. And there and there there's a, a diligence over time that's important as well. Uh, I think this came from Steve Martin's book, Born Standing Up. Uh, this is not in this book. I just really remember I wrote an essay like when I first encountered that book where Steve Martin talked about diligence as being really important, like in his stand developing his stand up career. And by diligence, what he meant was not like every day you're working really hard, but that you kept coming back to the same thing again and again. And you were willing to say no to like the other things that were going to derail it. And I really remember that from like studying Martin, that he just had his, he just for a decade, he was like, I'm just working on this thing and I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to it. It doesn't mean like every day you're working 12 hours, but it means you keep yeah. coming back to that. That sort of diligence over time for a long period of time is the recipe, not like today I'm working 10 hours and like, I'm just going to repeat that for three weeks until I'm done. It's like yeah. a different relationship with pace and work. And I, I love your comments on the importance of thinking of our goals in terms of different time scales, right? You talk about daily, weekly, quarterly, and then we might think of, as you're saying, five-year, 10-year, 20-year goals. Um, do you think we do this adequately? I mean, I uh, cer certainly uh, reading about this, it, it became clear to me that I am not doing this adequately. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's interesting because some professions force this. It's like my profession as a, as a professor forces this. Uh, and I think it's actually useful and instructive, like my own experience. So if you're a, a tenure track professor, like what matters is the scale of like roughly six to seven years, because you get hired at an institution, do what you need to do. But in between five and seven years from now, we are going to look at what is like the research you've done. Like what impact have you had on the world of research over the past half decade? And if it's sufficiently high, you get a stay. And if it's not, you're fired. That's how the 10 year system works. And so if you're a, if you're an assistant professor, you're working on like a five or six year time scale. That's what matters. It, it really doesn't matter if you're busy on Tuesday. I think that's relevant to many more jobs. We just don't know it. Like what we should really care about is what do I want to do in my thirties? Like what would success mm -hmm. look like? And that, that gives you a very different approach to the day than, you know, what am I doing this week as your primary time scale? But of course, of course, what you do each day. And what you do each week downstream results in what you do each decade, right? I mean, that there's a there's a direct relationship there that we that we want to have the same level of attention. We, we we want our days to be informed by our our goals for the decade. Yeah, I mean, this is why I'm a big fan of multi scale planning, where you know you have a plan for the whole season, which is informed by your plan for the decade. Like, what do I want to get done this fall? to really advance my vision for what I'm trying to do right now in my life. And then you look at that seasonal plan every week and you make a plan for your week where you're looking at your calendar and maybe you're going to move some things around or cancel some things, or you're looking ahead to see like where the big opportunities are to do certain types of work. And then you make a weekly plan and you look at that weekly plan every day when you now block your minutes of the workday. What am I going to do with each of the minute this day? And what you get in multi-scale planning is the 10 year vision percolates through these scales all the way down to the decision you're making about what do I want to work on next today, right? So it goes from decade down to the hourly scale without you having to consider all of it when you get to the day. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Okay, how, why don't we get to, to, your, to your third principle, obsessing over quality. How, how do we do this more effectively? Well, if we don't want to be obsessed with busyness, you know, what's the antidote? I think it's craft. Right. Yeah. Like the antidote, if we want to sort of reconfigure the way we think about doing useful work away from busyness and away from this anxiety of not doing things as lazy, not doing things as me missing out on my potential. The anecdote to all of that is to cultivate a real interest in craft, doing some small number of valuable things very well and getting better at doing those things. The more you cultivate this like real interest in craft and doing something really well, the more absurd busyness is going to start to seem, the more anathema it's going to be to you to be on an email all day long, right? It's, going, it's, it's, the, it's the cure for this need for freneticism. Uh, it also yeah. gives you the leverage. So if you work somewhere else, as you get better at things, you get more control over your life. You get what Adam Grant calls idiosyncrasy credits. I can now have more say over like when and how I work. And I have this weird system with the active and the waiting and I'm, I don't do meetings on Fridays or whatever it is. Hey, if you're bringing it in, I can do this. It's valuable. You can't, he can't, she can't. You get more permission to do those sorts of things. So it, it makes busyness unappetizing at the same time that it gives you more leverage to avoid busyness. If we don't feel 
a desire to obsess on quality or the craftsmanship of our work, it may be an indication we're not doing the right work, yeah. right? I mean, even w w whether you're a barista or a working, uh, taking care of animals at a kennel, or I don't know what you're doing, you, you, w whatever you're doing, there's an opportunity to obsess on the quality of that work. And hopefully we can all find a pathway to feeling that. Um, and, and, and of course, in this, in this age of emerging, you know, super intelligence, we're not going to, as as a, as a species, speed is not our uh, is not going to prove to be our our, our greatest strength uh, as as other forms of intelligence are emerging. It's the it's I think it's the love of craft maybe that's going to yeah I think our, our, our email response time is not going to be our bulwark against AI. Like, that's right. We, that's right. We're very good at Slack. Is not going to preserve what makes humans humans. I want to quickly tell you about the next Big Idea Club's book box subscription. Every quarter, we get our friends Malcolm Gladwell, Adam Grant, Susan Cain, and Daniel Pink to pick the two best new works of nonfiction, and then we send them to our subscribers. If you sign up, you'll also get access to beautiful audio and video e-courses, invitations to exclusive AMAs with top authors, membership in our LinkedIn community, and VIP access to our live events. Plus, you'll be helping us continue to make this show. So if any of this is interesting to you, go to nextbigideaclub.com to learn more. And if you do end up subscribing, use the promo code podcast at checkout to get 20% off. That's nextbigideaclub.com, promo code podcast. You say towards the end of, of your new book, Slow Productivity, that you hope that this will be the beginning of a larger sea change in how we think about doing cognitive work. I love your kind of broader observation that when it comes to trying to figure out how to perform athletically, physically at our best at a new sport or trying to get fit, we look for coaches, we look for expertise, we assume that there's a methodology that we don't yet know in order to figure out how to do it better. When we all try to do our best cognitive work, we're less likely to assume that we don't yet know the right methodology. This seems kind of like a bizarre oversight, or, or, or maybe it's because we didn't used to need instruction, but, but I, I see it as part of your thesis that we need to take very seriously the science of what the most effective methodologies are for doing the cognitive work that matters most to us. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I, you can't overemphasize the degree to which knowledge work is really an outlier when it comes to this. And, you know, I've done a bunch yeah. of writing on this. It, it, to me, what it really comes down to is this, this, uh, this fundamental property of knowledge work. It was instilled early on. I mean, this is Peter Drucker, the writing in the sixties, yeah. writing in the seventies. There was this idea that look, knowledge work is creative and intellectual. It's a sort of magic alchemy that happens in people's heads. It's unknowable how this happens. So like what we can do as managers is have clear objectives, and so uh, here's what, you know, our objectives are. He invented management by objectives and make sure people yeah. have the resources they need. But then we sort of have to just let the cooks cook. And like, that's yeah. the way we think about, no, we don't think about any other sector or any other like high-end pursuit that way. We don't think of athletics that way. We don't, we don't build cars this way. We don't just say, yeah. we got a yeah. bunch of great engineers. Uh, hey guys, just like build me some Ford Tauruses, you know, like work together, figure it out. Like, here's our objective. We want to build 10 this week. You know, no, we figure out, you know, what's the right way to do this. So knowledge work is really an outlier in that way. And there's great advantages to it because like creative intellectual work can't be broken down into an assembly line. We'll never make it steps by steps. But I think we got way too hands off and we didn't think about, well, how do we like structure, build scaffoldings around this work? What about workload? What about collaboration? What about like how we talk about the work back and forth? Yeah. We're just like, this is just up to people to figure out. It's not my business as a manager. So I'm hoping that we change that, that we increasingly interrogate, like, what are we trying to do in knowledge work? What does it mean to be productive? Because a pseudo productivity concept is just not working, especially in the world of, of uh, IT and fast communications. And what's the right way to actually get here? And this way is better than that. And why are we doing this versus doing that? We just don't have those conversations. We shouldn't be afraid to have them. And so it's like a big part of my program and a lot of my writing is when it comes to doing stuff with our brains, we have to think a lot about how we're doing it. It can't just be this mystery that like, yeah, we all just kind of do it right. 
you know, we just sort of like turn on our email and we just rock and roll and things get done. Uh, it needs, it deserves a lot more scrutiny than that. Well, and particularly since we've moved into an era where it's become much more challenging to do that work because of all these new technologies and distractions, as you point out in your, in your books, right? I mean, that it feels a little bit like the 1970s were for health. The, this introduction of ultra-processed foods and a culture of constant snacking and fast food restaurants everywhere. Yeah. And you had the beginnings of a recognition that, wow, maybe this isn't good for us. Wow, maybe we should exercise. And a, a small subset of the population acting on that, right? <laughs> but it took many more decades for us to say, actually, you know, there are foods that we should uh, avoid eating and exercise needs to be a regular part of our of our diet and so on. It, it, it feels like maybe we're in the 70s when it comes to cognitive exercise, <laughs> right? In the sense yeah. of like, we're just, we, there's a small subset of people who are beginning to take actions to be more sort of thoughtful and disciplined about approaching it in a way that's, that's healthier. Yeah. I mean, it's a good analogy because we had the same issue with food, which is for most of human history, we never worried about having too much food. Like that wasn't even an issue. So like, how could it possibly be bad that like food is cheaper and we have more food available and it's like easier to prepare? How could that possibly be bad? It led to this huge health crisis. That's kind of what's happening with information technology. How could it right, possibly exactly. be mad that we have more ways to communicate? It's faster than it's ever been before. Uh, it's more fully featured. Like we just have all these more options and it's quicker and more available. How can more possibly be bad? And of course, you know, this happens again and again throughout human history. More can be very bad. Well, in terms of all these systems, Cal, how, how is your current system working in your own life and how is your work-life balance? I mean, that, so we think of you have, writing all these books as having it all figured out. Are there things that you continue to struggle with or that you're working to further optimize or you feel like you have it dialed right now? No, I never feel dialed during book tours, for example. Like, I, I think <laughs> right. of them as like temporary destabilizations, which just further commits me to what I think work should be like, because it's, it's like my taste of what I think work is like for a lot of people. Um, it's because it's constant, uh, interviews and calls and the day is very fragmented and I get very little actual, you know, deep work done. So like if I was in this mode all the time, I would never be able to finish books. I'd never be able to actually like produce the stuff that I talk about. I usually flee book tours and, and go into isolation for a couple months afterwards to sort of detoxify from it. But even this book itself, part of it too is why it's been useful is that I think early in the pandemic, for example, like a lot of people, it was a weird time it was lonely. It was also like an uncertain time, you know, yeah. like what's going to happen in publishing? What's going to happen? Yeah. Like is, is yeah. universities going to be a thing? And I went into like a mode of like, we got to get more irons in the fire. The sort of like, okay, let's, you know, let's start this. Let's move that. I got the podcast going. I, I had some business ideas. It really, I started up a bunch of stuff because I was just alone and nothing was happening. And I was worried that, yeah. you know, um, the publishing industry, Barnes and Noble is going to go out of business. The universities were going to shut down. And then I had too much on my plate. And so there's been a lot of like unwinding. I was like, okay, no, no, no. Unwind, unwind. Let's try to get back to my platonic ideal, which is I'm writing about stuff that's relevant to my academic job. And, and like, I'm just thinking and writing. And then every few years I, I come up and do a book tour. I've been fighting for the last two years now just to get back to that ideal from, again, temporarily, these sort of destabilizations happen. And then you iterate and like, okay, no, no. We're fine. I've been down this road before. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Get rid of that idea and try to sort of pull things back in again. So there's a little bit of self-coaching here in slow productivity. Yeah. Well, you're clearly just getting started, Cal. You're 41 years old. When you think of these multiple timescales of, of goals and ambitions, what do you aspire to do in the next decade or the next few decades? What kind of books do you want to write in the future? What academic goals do you have? How, how do you think about your next few decades? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see things, decades is my like typical scale, my biggest scale. Um, so like my 20s, for example, were about skill building. I wanted to be an academic. I wanted to be a writer. I spent all of my 20s getting there, right? So when I turned 30, I published my first like sort of major hardcover idea book and got hired at Georgetown. Um, my 30s were about being establishing professional success in those fields, right? I'm starting a family. Uh, we started having kids when I was 30 and it was like, okay, I want to have like financial stability. I want to be successful in these fields, right? So my thirties were about be a good computer scientist, get tenure early. Like I did like do that. Um, now become a writer that's actually a successful writer. And I, a deep work came out in that period and that book took off and I started getting bigger book deals. So my thirties were about now that I have the skills, be successful in these fields. 
my 40s, I'm thinking a lot more about impact and legacy. Like, okay, now mm -hmm. I want to um, take these skills out for a spin. I want to create, like, let me, sh let's shape our life in a way that's remarkable. Let's try to have as big of an impact as possible with what I'm working on. So like I, I, now I'm thinking in these sort of bigger picture things. So I want, uh, if my 30s were about building a stable life for my family, my 40s are about building a remarkable life for my family. My 30s were about, you know, be a successful thinker. My 40s are about develop ideas that really like fundamentally improve or change the way big parts of our sort of society operate or the way we understand things. So like my 40s is definitely now a, a phase of remarkability and impact is the things I'm trying to figure out how to do. Well, you seem to be on uh, roughly on Ben Franklin's time scale there. Maybe maybe, maybe you'll be in in, in Paris uh, negotiating on behalf of the country uh, in a few decades. Um, thank you, Cal Newport, for taking time out of your busy schedule, albeit executed at a natural pace with seasonal breaks. Such an interesting conversation. Well, I enjoyed having this uh, this slow, naturally paced, high quality focused conversation with you. <laughs> slow productivity in action right here. <laughs> We're working on it. Thank you, Cal. Thanks, Rufus. Cal Newport's new book, Slow Productivity, The Lost Art of Accomplishment Without Burnout, is out now. If you'd like to hear him summarize the book in 15 minutes, download the Next Big Idea app and search for Cal's book by it. And if that still hasn't slaked your thirst, check out Cal's previous appearance on this show, that episode was called Email, Would the World Be Better Without It? And you can find it by scrolling back through the feed or following the link in the show notes. One last thing before I go, we want to try something new and we need your help. Every month, our team here at The Next Big Idea puts together a list of the most exciting upcoming books. We call them Next Big Idea Club Must Reads. We'd love it if you'd take a look at that list and let us know which books you think we should feature on this podcast. There's a voting form in the episode notes. We can't wait to hear from you. Today's episode was produced by Caleb Bissinger. Mike Toda made it sound good. We get support from the Quality Obsessed team at the LinkedIn Podcast Network. I'm Rufus Griscom. See you next week.